Imagine what would happen if everything controlled by a computer suddenly stopped working. It's already happening. A hacker tried to poison a Tampa Bay area water system. We have had close call after close call. Cyber warfare, fought with cyber weapons, designed to defeat cyber security. Offense alone won't keep us safe. It's time to really, really refocus on defense. Russia is likely responsible for hacking 18,000 government and private organizations, including the U.S. Department of Justice, Treasury, State, and Homeland Security. In her new book, This Is How They Tell Me The World Ends, New York Times cybersecurity reporter Nicole Perlroth lays out the alarming details of the growing threat of cyber attacks and the shady underground market trading in zero days, the nickname for software vulnerabilities hackers discover and then sell to the highest bidders. We might be the most offensive, advanced cyber superpower in the world, but we're also the most vulnerable because we are so digitized. What will we be left with as hackers find zero days in nuclear power plants, nuclear missiles, ATMs, hospitals, traffic control, air traffic control? And what is the United States government doing to prevent it? We're not even prepared for one of those things, let alone all of it happening in tandem. We haven't had the cataclysmic attack, but we're really only one or two clicks away from it. So I'm hoping the book sparks these discussions so that we can really start taking our defense seriously. Nicole Proroth, thanks very much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. And before we get started, we wanted to let folks know that there are signed copies of your book available at Left Bank Books in the Central West End. So, Nicole, uh, <laughs> were you going for terrifying? Because I haven't <laughs> slept well since I read your book. I was, but you know, it's so funny to me because it's not terrifying to me because I think I've just been steeped in it for so long. I am the frog in the boiling water, you know, and the book is really my, the hope with my book is that we can avoid the most terrifying of these cyber attacks um, if we can stop letting the people who are most incentivized to keep doing what they're doing, which is making us all vulnerable, uh, lead these discussions. I want to make this accessible. I want to put these debates in the average person's hands so that we can all talk about how to hack our way out of this mess. And for too long, there's been just in many ways, the government and, and the cybersecurity industry have almost counted on our ignorance uh, to lead these discussions. And so I wanted to equalize everything. And, and if that meant terrifying people um, out of their complacency, then so be it. You know, hence the title. It worked. Speaking of the title, the, the they in the, this is how they tell me the world ends. And just so people understand, this is not just a bunch of kids in hoodies trying to get free cable. I mean, you went all the way to the top levels of government in some of the sources that you relied on. Yes. And so, you know, the they in here was 10 years ago, they being government officials and the security industry kept telling me we are due for a cyber 9-11 or a cyber Pearl Harbor, some kind of cataclysmic attack using code that would bring down the grid or send airplanes crashing into each other through a hack of air traffic control or trains colliding or contaminate our drinking water. And I would always ask them back then, okay, so when is this, when do you think this world ending attack is going to happen? And without fail, they always had the same answer, which was 18 to 24 months. 18 to 24 months seemed to be the magic number because it was just far enough that, you know, if, if I forgot about it and something didn't happen, then I wouldn't hold them to it, but just close enough to add some urgency. And back then, I just thought this was overhyping the threat. It was trying to scare us too much. A lot of companies use this to sell useless security software. And 
for the last 10 years, I've been exploring, okay, what is leading us down this road? What is bringing us towards this attack? And it turns out a lot of it is our own complacency, but also there's a lot of incentives for government to keep us vulnerable, to keep our software vulnerable so they can exploit it for espionage, to spy on terrorists everywhere, but also uh, for battlefield preparations, to plant code in Russia's grid, for instance, to turn off their power should there be the appropriate geopolitical trigger. So what I found was, you know, we haven't had that cataclysmic attack yet, but arguably where where we are right now uh, is in some ways worse in that all our intellectual property is gone. China took it. Uh, Russia has been caught hacking into our grid. We're currently unwinding a Russian attack on our government networks that I think it'll be years before we can confidently say we've eradicated every last Russian backdoor. Ransomware is holding hospitals and schools and cities hostage. Um, and so this is a pretty precarious place to be. And you know, it, we haven't had the cataclysmic attack, but we're really only one or two clicks away from it. Uh, so I'm hoping the book sparks these discussions so that we can really start taking our defense seriously. Well, and it's probably a little bit rich for us to, us meaning the United States, to to take the high road on this because we're doing the same thing to everybody else. Yes, and you know, for, for you know, I, I I am hard on the NSA in the book, but you know, a lot of what they have done um, in terms of espionage and these battlefield preparations, if something were to happen here and it turns out we weren't doing these things, then we would say the NSA wasn't doing their jobs. The problem is when you get into the details and you see that part of what makes up cyber weapons and espionage tools is just these holes and vulnerabilities in everyday software, you know, our iPhone software, Android software, Microsoft Windows, whether you know it or not, you're using it. And very granularly, the NSA and Cyber Command and other intelligence agencies have been finding holes in these systems and exploiting them for espionage or to drop a cyber weapon one day. And that was all fine a couple of decades ago when we were using one software, Russia was using another, Iran was using another, China was using another. But these days we're all using the same software. So if we choose to keep a certain piece of software vulnerable, then we're essentially keeping Americans vulnerable too. And these aren't just for espionage anymore. These are for battlefield preparations. The software, Microsoft Windows, is getting into the power grid and our airplanes and air traffic control and our drinking water. So not only are we keeping Americans open to surveillance and espionage, but we're really opening ourselves up to the kind of critical infrastructure attack that government officials themselves had warned me about for a long time. A good example of what you were just talking about using one software making us vulnerable is the whole solar winds thing which we just saw where all these agencies private companies were all using the same software and it was easy to get into because their password was something easy that's right so solar winds is this software that it turns out most american companies in the fortune 500 and our government agencies including really sensitive agencies like the pentagon and the department of homeland security and the Department of Energy, which oversees our nuclear labs, all, it turns out, use SolarWinds software to see what was on their network. And in this case, turns out Russia used SolarWinds, used their software update mechanism as a backdoor to get into their clients in many of these sensitive government agencies I just mentioned. Now, we didn't discover it through some epic NSA cyber offensive. We discovered it through a hack of FireEye, which is one of the country's top cybersecurity firms. FireEye discovered it was hacked. Then in the course of that attack and unwinding it, discovered that the hackers had come in through SolarWinds. And then they tipped off the government and they tipped off Microsoft and all of these other companies that realized that they too may have been used as a conduit for this Russian attack. And what's really crazy about this is it's clear that Russia has our number. And they're really using our constitution against us because once they got into SolarWinds, which is an American company, they set up a command and control system in New Jersey, in the United States, using GoDaddy and Amazon Web Services to direct their attack. Now, the NSA is inhibited because of privacy protections, 
from looking at these domestic systems. So it was looking at Russian servers somewhere, maybe, you know, servers elsewhere that the Russians have used in other attacks. And it was totally blinded by the fact that uh, they were operating this attack from inside the United States. The phone call is coming from inside the house. Yes, exactly. Wow. Scary stuff. Well, and even with this water plant hack that was not too long ago down in Florida, it was hot only because the, the operator saw the cursor moving around. Are we just catching these things kind of by accident? Yes. We have caught hackers rifling with the locks of our dams. We've caught them inside our hospitals. They've held these systems hostage. We know from a Department of Homeland Security screenshot that was published a few years ago that Russian hackers actually had their fingers on the switches at an American power plant, and not just one, but several. So, you know, these have all been really close calls. And it's not like we have some great cyber defense that's keeping anything bad from happening. Just in each case, we happen to catch them at the right time and cut off remote access. But it's always been these close calls. And they keep getting more and more serious and more and more deadly as we go on. Sounds like we're due for some sort of a catastrophic event. Yeah, we are. It just seems like the people who are doing this, namely Russia, um, are are waiting for, like I said, this geopolitical trigger, you know, for there to be some broader conflict before they turn off the lights or shut off the lights. But we know they can do it because they've done it twice in Ukraine. And for the book, in the prologue, I go to Ukraine to talk to people about these attacks. And basically what they said is, we are Russia's test kitchen, but we're not their end target. You're their end target. And when this comes for you, it will be much worse because we are just not very digitized here. Our hospitals are not online. They still cast uh, their votes by paper. Um, you know, their power grid is not completely linked up, although in that case, they successfully managed to turn Ukraine's lights off. But here we're so wired up that we might be the most offensive, advanced cyber superpower in the world, but we're also the most vulnerable because we are so digitized. When we talk about nuclear uh, forces, nuclear missiles, they talk about mutually assured destruction, that whole Reagan doctrine about, you know, we could blow you up, you could blow us up, so let's just not blow each other up. Does that, is there something to that with regard to, to cyber warfare? I mean, if they can turn off yes. our lights and we can turn off their lights, then what's the point? Yes, exactly. I mean, we've definitely per been pursuing the digital version of mutually assured destruction. After 2016, after Russia you know, essentially tried to hack the election, and after we caught them inside our grid, uh, my colleague David and Singer and I reported that Cyber Command was hacking the Russian grid and making quite a loud show of it, as you said, for deterrence to say, hey, if you turn the lights off here, will turn the lights off there. The problem, though, with nuclear analogies is, one, the barrier to entry for these attacks is so much lower. You don't need fissile material to pull off a deadly cyber attack. And two, this is just code we're talking about. So if a country like Iran discovers that we have planted code on their systems in the event we need to turn off their lights, they can pick it up, they can dissect it, reverse engineer it, retrofit it and turn it back on us. Um, so, you know, in that sense, nuclear analogies don't really apply that well, but clearly we're trying to make them work. It's just that all of this ends up making all of us more vulnerable. A lot of your book is going back and forth with these folks who are the hackers looking for what are called zero days or O days, I guess, depending on who you talk to. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to tell us a little bit about Zero Day Charlie, because he's right here in St. Louis, which brought you to yes. St. Louis. Yes. It's so funny because I was I went to go meet with him and then I was at the St. Louis airport at Beers of the World at the airport. And I ran into an old college friend of mine and she said, what are you doing here? And I said, it's a long story. <laughs> but yes, so Zero Days are just holes in software that are not known to the manufacturer. So Zero Day Charlie, yes, he's based in St. Louis. He's a real character. And I dedicated a chapter in the book to him because where I thought he really came into play here was he used to work at the NSA. 
He knew that zero days and zero day exploits had real value to government, especially to intelligence agencies. He also saw that on the outside, technology companies like Microsoft and Apple and Google, when hackers told them there was a zero day in their products, when they told them, you know, you have a real problem, I found this flaw in your software and you should patch it. Hackers were often getting, you know, a call back from the general counsel or an attorney threatening, threatening to sue them and really not taking seriously these holes in their software or showed very little incentive in fixing them. Or when they did fix them, they often introduced even more zero days and, and flaws in the code. But he knew from being in government and being in touch with people in government that hackers could just make hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases selling knowledge of that vulnerability to government agencies or to a broker who worked for government agencies. And his goal was to write this all up in a white paper. And so I went to go visit him in St. Louis. And he told me of this meeting, you know, once the NSA heard that he was planning on selling this zero day and potentially documenting, you know, how much a hacker could make in the gray market, the government market, they came to visit him at the St. Louis airport hotel. And they said, you know, meet us here. And, you know, oddly enough, he actually thought that they were planning on buying his zero day exploit for him. He, he told his wife that day that by the time he got home, they would have enough money to pay for the kitchen renovation they wanted to do. But when he showed up at the airport hotel, there was no bag of cash. There was no offer of any reward for the zero day he found. They just said, we don't want you to talk about this. And so really what he represents in the book, and of course, this is all a true story, but to me, what he represents is um, the lengths that the agencies have gone to keep these programs and these payments uh, quiet. And uh, just of the simple fact that they will pay hackers to turn over these bugs and never tell a soul. And, and so that's what that chapter dealt with. When it comes to the point someday where someone says, let's really do something big, which do you think they'll go for first against the United States? I don't know what they've come for first, but I don't think it's just going to be one target. I think it's going to be a hit on some of these smaller municipalities that don't have the security resources of, say, a PG&E, and they're going to turn off the lights and they might try to contaminate the water supply like we just saw in Florida. And they're probably going to try and create some disruptions at the hospitals and with their healthcare system. And there might be an added, you know, attack on our transportation and on air traffic control. And so it could be just all of these things at once. We're not even prepared for one of those things, let alone all of it happening in tandem. So that is the attack I really worry about. It's not just going to be one. It's going to be a coordinated hit on various parts of our critical infrastructure. Well, your focus isn't geopolitics, obviously. It's, it's cyber issues, but they're sort of all you know tied together in this. I mean, what would be the point of attacking a small town's water system or a power system? You mess it up, the people suffer, and it's terrible. But you know, ultimately, what did you accomplish? I think that it's creating the seeds of doubt in democracy, you know, that, that ultimately, if they can turn off our lights, it's a sign that we cannot trust our own government to protect us, you know, to question whether we should not be allowing the NSA to look in our systems, um, to, you know, basically use our constitution against us. Just in the solar winds attack, um, you know, they were operating this attack from New Jersey because by law, the NSA is prohibited from looking at domestic servers and systems. So they really have our number. And I think the goal ultimately is to turn people against de democracy and free markets. And if suddenly you have these attacks like they pulled off in Ukraine, where they turned off the power and heat in the dead of winter, people are going to start questioning whether their system of government works. Well, it's not making me question democracy, but it's making me question my own passwords and things like that. What mm -hmm. what can people we obviously can't do anything to affect what the government's doing except vote. Uh, but what can we do ourselves to protect ourselves from being targets? Yeah. So I think everyone just needs to think about what is it that you have that a hacker might want or a nation state might want. In my case, because I'm a journalist, it's my sources. 
So that is the thing that I guard with my life. You know, I take my most sensitive conversations and interviews offline. I had a source for a while until the pandemic where we would never communicate digitally. We just met at the same dim sum place at the same time on the same day every month. And we left our devices behind. I use things like Signal, the encrypted messaging app to have sensitive communications. I turn on two-factor authentication on my email accounts and social media accounts, Twitter accounts, et cetera. For most people, it's your personal data and your financial data. So for your personal data, the best thing you can do is use a pan- password manager. And you know the passwords are gone. They're all gone. I got a call a couple of years ago that was pretty funny from a guy with a Russian accent. It turned out he was uh, originally from Ukraine. But he said... Nicole, I just found the billion passwords and your password is in here. <laughs> and I said, oh God, what is it? And he said, it starts with an F and it ends with an eight, you know, and it was my password. And I had used that password thinking it was my best one. Um, so, you know, all of this stuff is sitting in a dark web market somewhere. Your passwords have been for sale for a long time. It was, they were stolen from things like, uh, you know, attacks on retailers and that kind of thing. So, Don't use the same password, you know, use a different password for every site. Use a password manager if you have to. Turn on two-factor authentication. You know, think about, do you really need Alexa or do you really need that smart fridge? You know, think about what is it in your daily life? How much of this really needs to be digitally connected? For a long time, we asked ourselves, can we do this? Sure, let's do it. Instead of, should we be doing this? And, you know, that carries over to businesses. Businesses, for a long time, their goal was having the most digitized product, getting that product to market first, beating out the competition. They never stopped to think, is this product secure? Um, And the answer is no, they were never secure. And so it's really important for businesses to test their code, to do regular penetration tests, to use multi-factor authentication, to only put a product out to market when they know that the code has been vetted and tested, to know what's in their systems. I mean, when solar winds happen and I called government agencies, half of them didn't even know they were using solar winds, let alone that solar wind software is built and tested in places like Belarus. So we really need to step back and kind of take inventory of our digital lives and ask ourselves, you know, where am I vulnerable? Where would a hacker benefit from from getting into my systems? And how can I better protect that thing, um, whatever it is for you? Whether it's Russia or China or Iran or North Korea, uh, would cyber treaties do anything? So I think, yes, I think they could. Um, but the problem is when you get into the fine print. So You know, some people like Brad Smith, the president of Microsoft, have pitched the idea of a digital Geneva convention where we would all agree not to attack things like each other's elections or hospitals or civilian targets. Um, And that obviously sounds great because, you know, we've seen a lot of hacks on our election and our transportation systems and our hospitals in the past few years. The problem, as I was saying earlier, is so if the Pentagon and the NSA and Cyber Command agree not to hack these civilian targets, okay. But in Russia and China and Iran, we know that they outsource many of their attacks to the satellite contractors, to cyber criminals. In China, you know, they will tap the top security engineer at Baidu or Tencent on the shoulder and say, tonight you're working for us. We know some of the most sophisticated attacks out of China these days don't come from the PLA. They don't even come from the Ministry of State Security. They come from these satellites of hackers. The Ministry of State Security taps on the shoulder and says, you're doing this for us because it gives them that plausible deniability. And we don't have that here. We're not tapping the guy at Google on the shoulder and saying, tonight you're hacking, you know, this Russian target for us. So when it comes to agreeing to norms, it becomes very difficult because we have this very cynical, as we should, view of Russia. And we assume that they would easily work around these norms. The other thing is we are still the most advanced player in the cyber realm. We pulled off an attack with Israel called Stuxnet 10 years ago on an Iranian nuclear facility that was just brilliant. 
You know, we, in some cases, spun their centrifuges up and destroyed their uranium that way. And then we'd sit back for 27 days. And then 27 days later, we would get into the centrifuges and slow them down to a trickle. And then we'd sit back for 27 days. And all the while, when engineers looked at their screens, everything looked like it was functioning normally. That What happened was we ended up destroying a 1,000 of Uran, uh, Iran centrifuges. We set their nuclear ambitions back years. No one has pulled off anything close to that in the last 10 years. So we are still way out of the pack offensively. Um, and I don't think we want to agree to any norms that handcuff what we, the United States and you know, our closest allies in the UK and Canada and, and great um, Australia and New Zealand, uh, what we could do uh, because some of these attacks have kept, you know, kept us from getting out of a war. It's really interesting to go back to that Stuxnet attack, by the way, and look at the politics of it. You know, Israel was really pressuring us to give them our bunker buster bombs. And George W. at the time, we were seeing more soldier deaths in Iraq than ever before. Uh, we were already out overstretched in Afghanistan. And the last thing that we wanted to do was get into a third war in the Middle East. And every simulation the Pentagon did showed that if we allowed Israel to bomb Natanz, it would drag us into World War III. So in some ways, that, that computer attack was, it saved lives. You know, it kept the jets on the ground. It kept us from a third war. Um, but once it got out, it also showed the world what they were missing out on in terms of these capabilities. Well, and I guess we have to ask ourselves while we're playing whack-a-mole with Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, others, we have to ask ourselves about domestic terror threats right now, especially. Mm -hmm. I mean, do we have any kind of <laughs> anybody working on that? Yes, we have to worry about a domestic terror attack. In fact, I think the water treatment facility hack we talked about earlier in Florida, I would not be surprised if whoever did that uh, was an American, you know, but it'll take us a while to figure that out. Um, but yes, we really have to be worried about domestic terrorists and people using this for mayhem. And, you know, someone we still don't know who left those bombs uh, around the Capitol on January 6th, uh, you know, and the, it, people could just as easily cause the same kind of destruction with code. Can you give us anything reassuring? I'd really like to sleep tonight. Yeah. I mean, the thing I, the thing is, I we have not had the big world ending attack. OK, so that's good news. The other piece of good news is solar winds. I mean, this attack is so pervasive. It's so inside our government networks. We completely missed it. Um, like I said, it's going to be a long time before we get these out. But it appears this was designed for espionage. They wanted to get our emails and our strategy planning documents. They didn't want to actually turn off anything or decimate our data like they've done in other attacks. Um, and I think that attack has left us, the United States, with no choice but to pause, <laughs> reflect on where we are defensively, which is woefully behind, to get a better sense of the software that gets into our systems, to understand that just because you can digitize something that we probably should not be, um, to understand that all of this is a target for advanced nation state hackers, and the only way forward is up. You know, we really have hit rock bottom with the exception of having a mushroom cloud. So the only way out of this is to recalibrate ourselves to prioritize defense. And for the last 10 years, it has just been offense, 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 hacking, 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 stockpile to zero days, you know, pull off these attacks. We can defend ourselves through offense alone. And this year, we learned that that was a complete fallacy. And so if there's any good news here, it's, okay, that was a fallacy. Offense alone won't keep us safe. It's time to really, really refocus on defense. Well, it's fascinating. It's frightening. And all kinds of things in between. But the book is This Is How They Tell Me the World Ends, available locally here in St. Louis at Left Bank Books. Nicole Perlroth, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much. I love talking to you. 